Well, I got a bunch of new kits coming in, which means I need to go ahead and make some room. So let me go ahead and find something that's been sitting here for about a decade. So no, no, hmm, look like fun, but maybe next time. Wait, wait, ah, perfect, right on the bottom of the pile. And you know what? To make even more room, I might as well build two of them. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with another double feature model showcase video. And for this one here, we got a pair of LAV25 ADs. These two models here are built for my own personal collection and are not for sale and or purchase. However, like I frequently mention in these videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. These two models here are built out of the box, and during the construction there are some things to watch out for, and we're going to be discussing all of that in this video. So stay tuned, because there's going to be a bunch of content flying right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around these two models. And these two vehicles here are the LAV-25 AD. The AD, of course, stands for Air Defense. One thing that I was actually surprised by when I was working on these models was when I went to do a little bit of research on these vehicles, I wasn't really able to find a whole lot of information out there, which is pretty interesting because unlike many of the other vehicles that have been built throughout the years, where there's a good portion of research on the internet, for the LEV25 AD, that's really just not the case. So what you're going to see here is basically what I was able to piece together from the various resources I was able to find online. Now, like I mentioned in a previous video about the LAV-25, the LAV-25 was adopted by the U.S. military in the 1980s time frame. The original base vehicle utilized a wheeled armored car platform, but had a revolving turret that housed the Bushmaster cannon in it. The vehicle's chassis, however, proved to be a very adaptable one and was able to be configured in a multitude of different roles, from the command version to the tow anti-tank version, and for this variant that we have here, the air defense variant. The purpose of this vehicle was quite similar to what was seen on other self-propelled anti-aircraft guns utilized not only by the U.S. military, but by also several other militaries of the period, which was to give a vehicle that can keep up with the tanks and other armored fighting vehicles that was fully armored and enclosed, but can protect them from low-flying aircraft. This has always been an area of concern specifically for large armor columns where they are vulnerable to air attack from low-flying aircraft, but specifically in the post-war and Cold War era, low-flying attack helicopters. And this vehicle fits that bill pretty well. The vehicle is fully enclosed. Of course, it utilizes the LAV-25 platform, which gives you some decent armor protection from most small arms fire, but it also gives you the mobility to keep up with the advancing armor. For its main armament, the vehicle utilizes two pods, each containing four Stinger surface-to-air missiles. In addition to the Stinger missiles, the vehicle also utilizes a single... Gao 12U 25mm Gatling gun. In combination of the armament, the vehicle also utilized some sophisticated radar as well as other optical equipment in order for it to lock on to enemy targets in order for it to engage them. Aside from engaging air targets with the 25mm cannon, the cannon can also be used as a secondary role in protecting the vehicle from ground threats which may present themselves. All of these weapon systems and radar equipment were housed in a fully revolving turret which was specifically designed for the LAV-25 AD series and it's not one that was utilized on any other type of vehicle platform. Even with the added weight of all the electronics and weaponry, the vehicle was still able to be fully amphibious just like the standard LAV-25. The vehicle did utilize a crew of three, one driver and the other two crew members would be housed inside of the turret, which would operate the turret's many functions. From the information I was able to track down on this vehicle, the vehicles went through their T&E in 1993. Apparently, the results of this testing evaluation phase impressed the U.S. Marine Corps, where they went ahead and ordered more studies and more research to be put into this project. The vehicle 
continued through the 1990s time frame, receiving more new upgrades with both electronics as well as different type of weapon systems. Apparently in 1997 the US Marine Corps were satisfied with the end results and adopted the LAV-25 AD. It stated that about 17 of these units were ordered by the US Marine Corps and once delivered entered into the US Marines inventory. And it's at this point here where my research on this vehicle comes to an end. As we know 1997 was a very long time ago and a lot of events have happened during the years that came after that era. After doing a little bit more digging I wasn't able to find any further information on what the current status of the LEV-25 AD is with the current US Marine Corps inventory. The vehicles more likely have been upgraded throughout the years or I would imagine with more modernized electronics as well as upgraded weapon systems. Unfortunately however that information is just purely speculative because again info on this vehicle is pretty slim. Aside from the weapon systems upgrades I'm not sure if this vehicle has actually ever been deployed to an active combat area either in a location like Iraq or Afghanistan. And if anyone watching this video does know more information about this vehicle and can answer the following questions that I mentioned before, feel free to post that in the comment section listed below this video. Because not only myself, but I'm pretty sure many of my viewers and subscribers would be interested to know any updates about this vehicle type. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the models were first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplied you with. And here would normally be the kits at the start of the build. Unfortunately, when I went ahead and filmed the original unboxing portion of this video, sadly that information was lost on a memory stick that got corrupted and unfortunately that information is forever lost. But in a nutshell, basically the kits are going to start off as these 135th scale LEV-25 air defense vehicles from Metallery. These kits here have been sitting in the stash for over 10 years now, so it feels good to finally get to both of them and to finally get them built in out of the way. These kits here I picked up from a mail order catalog, either Squadron Mail Order or a, another store called Hobbyland. It's again a bit hazy, it's been a number of years like I stated before. And the reason why there are two of them was because of the, this particular kit here was on a clearance sale and I believe I picked it up for anywhere between 10 to 15 bucks a piece. So it was uh, definitely something I took advantage of at the time. And since the two kits are exactly the same, there's no need having two of the boxes here on the table. Now the LEV-25 air defense kit from Metallery was a interesting kit release to say the least. Like I stated in another LEV-25 base vehicle video, during the late 1980s and early 1990s you had a interest in modern armored fighting vehicles. Back in the late 80s, Eshi stepped up to the plate with their LEV-25 kit series and that kit series was one that was met with some popularity. Well, fast forward a number of years later into the early 1990s, Italeri began to follow suit and release their own range of LAV-25 vehicles. These kits here originally date back to 1993, and just like with the Eshi kits, Italeri went ahead and first started with the standard 25mm equipped version of the LAV-25 armor car. Over the next short time span they went ahead and introduced several other versions from the unit with the dual tow missile launcher to the mortar carrier and this unit that we have here which is the air defense version which is probably one of the more unique versions of the LAV-25 that were ever produced. The LAV-25 series that was made by Italeri was one that proved to be pretty popular. The kits were very nicely detailed and are a leg up compared to the slightly older tooling found on the Eshi kits. These kits here were in production by Italeri throughout the 1990s time frame and wouldn't be uncommon to encounter one of their LEV-25 base vehicles at your local hobby shop or you would see them in your monthly sales flyer from places like again Squadron Mail Order. Of all of the Italeri LEV-25 base vehicles, the air defense version seemed to be the one that was on the more rarer side compared to the other ones that I mentioned previously. Fast forward to 2005, Italeri decided to re-release this kit here and this is the release that we have here in my hand. The kit itself is identical to the one that was originally released in the early 1990s. The only difference that Italeri did was just change up the model's graphic design. 
These kits here are entirely comprised of injection molded polystyrene. And this includes everything from the hulls to the fittings to, yes, even the road wheels. It's not like some other kits on the market that feature a molded rubber tire for these components. On this one here, they're just straight up standard plastic. One thing that's interesting about this version, however, is that because of the windows that we have here on the turret, the vehicle does supply you with a fret of clear plastic components in order to achieve these detailed pieces. Starting with the model's box art, the box art that we have here is identical to the one found on the previous generation kit. The only difference is that the box art encompass the entire front pan or portion here of the box front and we had that old school type italery red labeling that would have been on this portion here for your header. If anyone has seen any of those older italery kits you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway here we have the illustration. It's not really much going on here it's just the AD version of the LAV25 going through a muddy road with just a decent background behind it. It's a, again, a simple illustration, but the quality illustration is pretty decent, to say the least. Moving from the box art, this takes the remainder of the graphic design, and is at this point here is when Italeri switched to this type of configuration for their box arts, where we have the blue and yellow banner running across the top, as well as the color scheme used for the side panels. Right here on top, we have the name of the vehicle in a pretty plain, but very legible typeface. In the yellow, we have the kit number, which is 6274, and of course, the vehicle is 135th scale. All the way here on the right side of the box art, we have the Italeri logo. From the main box art, takes to the side panels. This one here just has some basic information in all the different languages that are typically found on Italeri box arts. We have here a nice little silhouette of the vehicle, as well as the model's dimensions in centimeters. This panel here, we just have the little thumbnail of the vehicle as well as the type of graphic design like I mentioned before. On this panel here, we got some corporate information as well as two sample images of a built unit. And well, that's about it. Now at this point, normally I would crack the box open and show the kit contents, but unfortunately, like I stated before, that information was lost on a corrupted memory stick. And the box that we have here is literally just an empty box. Spoiler alert, by the time I'm filling this, the mall has already been completed. And one thing that I noticed is that even though these kits are pushing 30 years old, they aged remarkably very well. The Eshi kit is a little bit more on the simplistic end, and you can see in some areas where the kit's tooling is starting to show its age. But on the Italeri kits here, that's not really the case. You can build one of these models out of the box and have a really good representation of this vehicle from what I've seen. Now, since these kits came out, and by the way, for the longest period of time, if you were looking for an LEV25 based vehicle, Italeri was going to be your first go-to. The Eshi kit would be something that you would really default to if the Italeri kit either wasn't around or if they didn't produce that version, namely the command variant of the LEV25. From what I've seen and what I remember, Italeri never went ahead and actually made that version of the LEV25 kit. But other than that, Italeri was going to be your go-to. Now, in recent years, Trumpeter has stepped up to the plate with their range of LAV25 based vehicles. And from what I've seen, they basically have done the same versions that were made originally by Italeri, including the AD version that we have here. Although from what I've seen on the box art, their version is a slightly modified variant that has a large rocket pod that's located on the top, as opposed to some of the other fittings that are found on this kit that we have here. It would be interesting some point where if I do acquire the trumpeter kit in order to build it and then I could do a compare and contrast between the two. However, this is something that's just wishful thinking and possibly something I could look into for a future video. But other than that, like I stated before, right now for the purposes of this video here, these kits are something that are still relevant today in current year, which is 2020, as they were back in the early 1990s. Also, I just want to point out that these kits are still fairly easy to come by. It's not hard to track one of them down. And when they are found, because they are on the older side, can be had for some relatively affordable prices. I've seen these kits run anywhere from 15 to about 30 US dollars. Starting with the model suspension, the Italeri kit does render the LEV25 suspension in a nice manner. If we can recall on the older Eshi LEV25 kit, where that suspension was fleshed out but was a bit on the simplistic end, 
with the Italeri one here, it kicks it up to the next level and does have some better detailing compared to that older rendition from Eshi. If I pivot the model over, you can see the suspension components now in better light. Notice on the swing arms here, the Italeri kit has the rigidity braces all rendered out. As well as you can see some better knuckle detailing found on the turning and the drivetrain components. This is true for not just the front but also on the rear portions as well. On the inside portion here you can see the spring detailing found on the shock absorber as well as on the rear shock absorbers you can see how the detailing is rendered out on those parts as well. All of these suspension components were utilized out of the box and if you follow the instructions and take your time with it you should have some pretty decent results. One small quirk that I want to point out with one of the examples that I have here is that for some reason on the lower portion here, this component here needed some hand fitting. Now just like what was seen on the on the Eshi LAV25 example that I built, the swing arms and the center spine here are all molded as one piece which does really cut down the complexity of the build. However, on one of these two examples here, this little portion here where the center spine makes contact with the lower hull, the fit was a bit on the tight side and I had to do some small hand fitting with a needle file in order to get the piece to fit on in the correct manner. Why this is interesting is that while I was working on the other example, and unfortunately I don't recall which example it was, the other unit that I built didn't encounter this situation. I just simply snipped the parts off of the sprue, dropped them on onto the hull and they went on without any issues. So as for why this was the case, honestly I couldn't tell you. So this is something that you may or may not encounter on your build, but it's one that you might want to look out for. Now just like with the Eshi kit, the Italeri kit is no different in that the wheels are only designed to be mounted in this type of format, being in a straight line. There is no option to have the model with its wheels in a steer configuration either to the left or to the right. Now just like I've seen with the Eshi build, if you look on the internet and go on some news groups or some chat rooms, you'll see that a few people have modified their Italeri kit where they make some mods to the turning knuckles in order to have their vehicle rendered in the steered configuration. For my build here however, that's just not necessary as I like to have the wheels in the straight line format that you see on this model. From the swing arms, this now takes to the tires. Now the tires on this model here are the kit supplied units and are again decently rendered. Notice they do have the block type thread pattern which would be common on LEV25s from this era. The wheels are a two part assembly, much along similar lines as the Eshi kit, but where the two kits deviate is how they slip onto the wheel axles. On the Eshi kit, the hubcap is integrally molded in and then when you're ready to install the wheels, you just simply glue them to the wheel axle and you're all set. On the Italeri kit here, it's a little bit more elaborate. With the Italeri kit, the hubcap is a separate molded component and the way it's intended to be installed is that you install the wheel onto the axle and then the hubcap gets glued to the axle, keeping everything in place, so theoretically giving you the ability to spin the wheels. However, in practice, I found that once everything is assembled, you're not going to really have the ability to have the wheels rotate. I know this is going to sound strange, but you'll be surprised on how many comments I get in several of my other 135th scale videos where people ask, can you have the model's tracks or wheels rotate or have some playability feature to them? This kit here, that's not really going to be the case. Now, I presume if you go ahead and further hand fit these components more, perhaps you can loosen up the tolerances where they can spin. However, for the purposes of my build here, that's just not something I had a whole lot of interest in. While on the tires, I do want to point out that they are molded in a symmetrical format, which is quite customary and is done on just about all of the standard plastic AV kits that are on the market. Now, one thing that a lot of serious wheeled AFV modelers like to splurge on are replacement aftermarket wheels that have a blister found on the bottom portions of the wheels. Why this is done is if you look at a real car, for instance, like just go in your garage and literally look at the tires of your car, you'll notice that the bottoms do have a slight blister to them because this portion of the tire is actually what's holding up the weight of the vehicle. On the stock plastic tires here, that's not 
found on the moldings and it's again one that is generally found on the aftermarket replacement wheels that people generally purchase. If this is something that you want to add to your build, these wheels can easily be found from a multitude of different companies and as well as with the different thread patterns as well because as the vehicles have been in constant use with the US Marine Corps, the, there have been several other thread patterns that have been developed since the late 80s and the early 90s time frame. From the tires now takes us to the remainder of the lower hull details and this kit here does have quite a few of them. Namely, lots of little tie down points found here on the back as well as lots of little toe shackle mounts found on the front as well as the rear. All these components are separately molded and have to carefully be desprued and fitted to the model. And this is one aspect where you really have to take your time and exhibit a lot of care with because the kit does not give you enough if you lose one. There's only a finite amount found on the runners and if one flings a lost part of you, you're pretty much screwed and you're gonna have to scratch build a new one out of some plastic stock. This is not just true for the little lift hooks, but as well as the little U shackles that are found here and the U-shackles are functional. If I could get in here, you can see that things like to dangle. But after you handle them a lot, they like to fold up in the position that we have here. Either way, all of the little U-points are dangling on this model, which does lend itself for a nice little detail element. While on the back, you can also see the rear propellers, as well as the gearbox mechanism. All these are nicely rendered, I found on the Italeri kit, and the rear rudders are also nicely rendered as well. Moving up from these fittings takes us to the rear doors, and this is one aspect of the Italeri kit that does make it more improved compared to the older Eshi counterpart. If we can recall from that video, the Eshi kit has these doors integrally molded onto the rear plate. Well, on the Italeri kit, that's not the case. In fact, they are separately molded and do have separately molded little grab handles on both the interior and exterior portion of the kit. Undoubtedly, this is more appreciated on the open-topped version of the LEV25 kit, which I believe is their mortar variant. Because the hatches are separately molded, this allows you to have the hatches displayed in the open position in case you require this for some diorama use. Another benefit of having the hatches in its separate molded format is that this does lend itself to have the pieces be a little bit more finely molded and crisply detailed compared to the standard flat moldings that are found on the Eshi tooling. From the doors, this takes us to the remainder of the rear detailing, such as the grab handles, the brush guards, as well as the tail lights. All these components are kit supplied and are nicely detailed out of the box. This now leads us back to the bow area. Starting with the bow plane, just like with the Eshi kit, it's a separate bit of tooling that simply gets glued in place and looks very good once assembled. However, from there, this now brings us to the front headlight clusters. And this is another aspect of the Italeri kit that does have some improvements made over the older Eshi tooling. If you can see the headlight system, they are nicely rendered. Note here we also have the winch roller guides. Again, a decently rendered piece. All the components that you see here again are utilized out of box. While on this portion here, I want to point out on how the upper and lower hulls fit together. Just like with the Eshi kit, they are two halves that get glued together in order to form the shape of the LEV's hull. Now, on the Italeri kit here, on the very tip portion here of the nose, there is a small injection mark or injection pin that is found on both the top and bottom portion of the tooling. This is something that may lead to issues when it comes time for fitting these components together. So, on my builds here, I just polish it down slightly with a little bit of sandpaper or possibly a needle file. And with that small amount of material removed, the upper and lower hulls fit on like a dream without any problems. However, just like with the Eshi kit, once you have the, the top, the bottom, and the rear plate on, you are going to have a seam line to contend with on these two portions here, as well as also running along the bottom portions here of the rear plate. This was just removed with simple red putty and with a little bit of sandpaper. The seam was polished away into the format that we have here. This is something you want to do of course before you go ahead and mount on the propellers and the rudder mechanisms because obviously 
they are going to be in the way when it comes time for the polishing procedure. So get your hulls assembled first, and then you can start mounting on these components here. Why I have to mention this is because if you follow the instructions, it kind of makes you want to do this bit of detailing before you go ahead and get the hulls all squared up. And of course, this is true for not just this kit here, but for all of the LEV25 family of kits from not just Italeri, but from SGN. I wouldn't be surprised if the trumpeter kits utilize a similar assembly procedure. One other thing I want to mention about the bodywork is involving the little lift hooks that we have here on either side. You see, like with all Italeri kits, the indentations or the suggestions where you glue the components are illustrated by a little box which is integrally molded into these two sections here. And the box works great, but unfortunately this location here is in the line of fire when it comes time for your polishing and bodywork procedure. And on these builds here, it wasn't uncommon for me to polish away all of the suggestion points due to the bodywork. So you want to pay attention and you want to mark somehow where these components go to alleviate any sort of problems when it comes time for mounting these units on after the body work is completed. While on the lift hook, this now takes me to the remainder of the details that are molded into the upper hull. You see, with the way the Italeri kit is designed, they recycle and reuse the runners for the upper hull, the lower hull, as well as the suspension on all of their LAV25 family of kits for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Well, one side effect that this does have is that, like I said before, you have these suggestion points that are integrally molded in, and these are found on several sections here on the side of the hull for, of course, other renditions of the LAV25. Well, one problem that this may lead to is that if you do not address them or remove them, you'll build your model, paint it, weather it, and then complete it, and what you will see are these small little indentation points that are just scattered along the side of the hull here, and this can hurt the look of your model. Fortunately, during the build, these are very easily addressed and taken care of with just some sandpaper. Some fine sandpaper is all you need to just polish away these areas, and these small little suggestion points are so finely molded that they easily erase without a whole lot of problems or effort. Same, by the way, can also be said about the side seam here, which you will have when the upper and lower hulls meet. On this one here, just some super glue was added to the seam, and just like with the indentation points, that same sandpaper was used to polish everything down for the appearance that we have here. Back to the side hull component, it takes to this rack that we have over here, and this component is one that's specific for the AD version of the LAV-25. This rack is used to store the Stinger missiles that are used to reload the top-mounted canisters that we have here on the top. Now, with the way the kit is designed, the Stinger missile rack is integrally molded in this type of format, and then you have two separate end sections that get molded separately and then glued in place. The detailing is pretty good on these, but when it comes time to painting them, in order to really make this kit shine, you have to be very careful in how you do so. With the way the Stinger missiles are painted, I went with a different shade of green, which is one that would be typically seen on the Stinger missile tubes from some of the research images that I found. If you carefully paint these portions over here and the end portions that we have on either side, this is a great way to help your model by giving it a little bit of pop and introducing a bit of color that can break up the overall look of the vehicle's external scheme. This is more noticeable, I believe, on this one here because of the three-tone NATO camouflage pattern, but the exact same technique was utilized. Moving along takes to the opposite side detailing, and note we have these three boxes that we have in these sections. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that these three boxes are another AD-specific detailing that's utilized just for this kit. This now brings us to the exhaust manifold. This is recycled and is used on all the other Italeri LEV25 kits, and the piece itself is decently rendered out of the box. One feature that this one does have over the Eshi kit is that the exhaust manifold, I believe, is molded hollow, as opposed to the Eshi kit, which was a solid lump of plastic that we can recall from the other video, I went ahead and drilled out with a Dremel. On this kit here, the exhaust manifold is a two-part assembly, which means there is going to be a seam line to contend with on the top and bottom portions. Fairly easy to remove and polish away, and it's, again, quite customary for these type of kits. Moving up takes to the top deck, and you can see how the engine grills are nicely rendered, as well as the front hatch and the winch hatch system. The kit does have some nice deep 
engravings found in these two locations, which really helps with paint and weathering of these components. And as a quick compare and contrast, here I have the Eshi kit that I mentioned before, and you can compare how these components are rendered on each of the kits. In my opinion, on this aspect, the two kits are basically equivalent to each other, with the Italeri kit arguably having a slight edge over the older Eshi tooling, but at the end of the day, the two still compare pretty well in that regard. The Italeri kit, however, does have a superior driver's hatch compared to the Eshi kit, which if we notice is missing the hatch hinge detailing that we have here. And this now leads us to the turbine. Of course, this is the one aspect of this kit that differentiates it from the other LEV 25 family kits that are made by Italeri. Now, with the way the kit is designed, like with the Eshi kit that came out before this, and I wouldn't be surprised the trumpeter kits that came out after this, with the way the kit is designed, you have this roof here that can be switched out so that you can build this vehicle into different configurations. Because this is the AD version, we have this rectangular plate that's supplied on the turret runner and it just simply drops directly in place. Now, with the way the kit is designed, it's nicely engineered in that the plate just drops right in without any hand fitting or other seam removal being necessary. Moving away to the turret itself, you can see how the turret is shaped. It has a very interesting design to it, and it's one of the aspects of this build that drew my attention when I first saw it in the catalogs all those years ago. I like how the front, you have the two crew sections that are separated with this large trough, which of course is used for the rotary Gatling gun. Now, the kit itself does have some basic interior detailing. It's all integrally molded into the bottom pan. And the detailing consists of a couple seats as well as some rudimentary looking instrument panels. Now sadly, due to the lighting situation that I have here, we're not going to get a good look at the interior detailing found on this model due to the glare found here on the clear plastic windows. And I actually anticipated this, so during the construction I filmed sections where I was discussing the interior detailing in more depth, but sadly all those scenes were lost on that corrupted memory stick that I mentioned before. In a nutshell, the seats and the instrument panels were painted with a dark olive drab, and I also went ahead and painted the seat cushions and the little gauges and switches that were integrally molded into these sections over here to make, give them a little bit more pop. For the remainder of the turret interior, hopefully this pops up in screen, but you can see that I painted it with that same light sky blue color that I utilized on my 172nd scale M163 build. This color here is a common color that's used on the interior sections of American fighting vehicles from the 1960s time frame all the way up until today. Now for this vehicle here, I'm not quite sure if it's accurate for the use on the turret because like I stated before, finding reference material on the LEV 25 AD is really hard to do and when found, it's really slim. So as far as I know, I just took my best educated guess and went with the sky blue for the interior sections. I do want to say, however, that the blue does give a nice element to these builds. It gives a nice little color contrast and does make the model pop a little bit compared to leaving everything painted with NATO green or dark olive drab. Also, I severely doubt that these sections here would be painted in white, but perhaps I might be mistaken. Again, I don't really know too much about the vehicle at hand. One interesting aspect of the turret I want to bring up is with this axis panel that we have here. It is driving my OCD nuts, and I'm pretty sure a few of my subscribers and viewers are looking at this thinking that I screwed up because I mounted the component on cockeyed, but I must ensure you, this is exactly how I was recommended to install this component. With the way the kit is designed, we have one of those indentation lo location type features, and the component just drops on in this manner. And from what I was able to tell from the instructions, it's exactly the way you see it here on my build. Although again, it just looks oh so wrong to me. <laughs> Moving along, you can see the top portion of the detailing and this now takes us to the armament. And this is one aspect of the kit that's actually pretty cool because with this one kit here, you have the option to render your LEVAD in one of two configurations. With the other unit mounted directly next to it, you can see the options now in better view. With this version here, we have the center mounted Gatling gun, along with the Stinger missiles mounted in these two pods located on either side of the turret. 
While on the other option, we again have the center mounted Gatling gun, but the Stinger missile is located on this pot over here on the end, just like it is on the other version, but rather than having a second one here, it's mounted directly above the Gatling gun. In its place, we have an antenna base, which is located right here. Now, what's interesting with the way the kit is designed is the Gatling gun is actually connected to the Stinger missile pods via a linkage. And on this one here, you can see that when one of the units move, all three of the units move together. Now one modification that I did make to this rendition here involves the antenna. You see, with the way the kit is designed, the antenna just glues directly to the side in a static format. But I'm pretty much sure with the way the unit is designed that this antenna would be connected to that pivot bar. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe would actually actuate with the unit. And in order to do this, I modified the side of the turret here as well as the mounting spindle so that this piece plugs directly into it. And if you can see, it's all interconnected and everything moves in unison. Now with the other version here, I actually did the exact same modification because if you follow the kit and you move the elevation, only the one missile pod and the Gatling gun move in unison, while the other one would stay here in a static format. Just like with the antenna base, I made the exact same modification to the center spindle and the side of the turret here to allow all three of the weapon systems to move up and down in unison. Taking a closer look at the Stinger missile pods, you can see all the spot welds that are found on these sections, as well as the gaps that we have here on either end, both the top and the bottom. The pod itself is nicely rendered by the Italery kit, and also with the way the kit is designed, the pod is comprised of six parts that get glued together in order to form the shape of the unit. This is one of those aspects of the kit where you want to take your time with because you can easily mess up the orientation of these pieces and possibly if you have a little glue on your finger you can easily add a fingerprint or two which can easily hurt the look of the piece. Specifically if you try to polish it away you're going to run the risk of ruining some of those nice spot well details that I mentioned before. So take your time with this and you should be all right. Another thing I want to point out with the missile pods is with the way the pods are designed, they utilize four Stinger missiles per pod. And the kit does have the piece rendered where three of the units are still loaded, but one of the missiles have been fired. You know, it is hollow through the other side. And this is one of those aspects of the orientation you want to watch out with because you can easily invert one of the parts and you have one hole here and the other hole on the opposite side in a different location that don't line up. So something to keep aware of. When it comes time for painting, you note that I use the same colors to paint the loaded ones that I use here on the side portion of the loaded rack. And for the one that has been expended, I add a little puff of the airbrush to simulate the rocket soot from the missile after, after it fired. Of course, this is done to both the front and back portions of the pod. Moving our way back takes us to the antenna array mask that we have here, and this is just a kit supply component and drops directly in place with no fitting problems. The one thing I want to mention, however, is with the antenna bases. You see, the antenna bases that are supplied on this kit, and this is also true for the other one too on the other side, is that the wires are integrally molded in. And this is a problematic feature found on lots of plastic model kits. You see, with this type of feature, the antenna wire is something that's very frail, fragile, and it's a very bad snag point. It's something that's easily snagged up on your hand or on, on clothing or whatever, and when they snag, they generally snap. Once those components snap, they are almost impossible to reassemble and reassemble in a way that looks seamless. So rather than going through all of that, one mod that I make on all of my builds that have this type of feature is I just amputate the stock antenna wire, drill out the antenna base with a pin vise, and replace the antenna wire with a piece of floor wire. Of course, this was done to all of the antennas found on, this, on these two models here, from the ones on the back to the one here that I mentioned before on the side. Moving our way to the Gatling gun, this is probably one of my favorite aspects of this entire model, and with the way the kit is designed, they actually do a really nice job. The component is comprised of several pieces that get assembled in sub-assemblies, which leads itself to a nicely detailed, nicely rendered component overall. The receiver, I believe, is made of two assemblies that are, each of those are two halves, 
which means you are going to have some seams to polish away with some sandpaper. And the barrel sections are individually molded and you need to align them with the barrel aligners found on the front two portions here, as well as the portion here on the back. Everything is well illustrated in the instructions. And again, if you take your time and are careful with it, you can easily assemble this unit. Of course, this is something you definitely want to paint separately. And with the way the kit is designed, this unit just drops directly in place and fits in with the center elevation bar that I mentioned before. Moving back to the front takes to the smoker day launchers and these are the kit supply ones and they went on without any problems. But just like with all vehicles that utilize this four cluster type assembly, these pieces here are individually molded and get glued on these appropriate locations but are something you want to take your time with again because you can easily break them off or you can improperly glue them on and the pieces just won't align properly. So if you take your time with them, these pieces should work out just fine for you. From there, it takes to the windows, and this is another really cool aspect of this kit is that it gives you a fret of clear plastic runners, and the runners have the window detailing already integrally molded on, which would include the center glass pane, the frames with all their rivets. With the ones on the front, we even have the added detailing of the windshield wipers that are found on the front. Now, when it comes time for mounting these to the model, you have to be very careful, of course, on the adhesive that you use because if you use super glue for your builds like I do, this is not something that's going to work because super glue has a bad habit on having that white foggy gas that can easily ruin clear plastic. So on this one here, I actually had to go and use the old school red testers model glue that I have on hand in an, in an old archaic bottle, I might add. But I was able to secure these pieces in place and hopefully as the model ages, they don't pop off on me. But... If that happens, I'll probably just opt for some better plastic cement and just carry on from there. But for now, the pieces look like they're holding up pretty well. One other quirk I want to point out in regards to the turret is with the way the turret rotates. Because of this box that we have here, and by the way, this box is mounted in the appropriate location, it will make contact with the corner here of the turret and it will prevent it from spinning a full 360 degrees. If I take the turret, and rotate it, you'll notice that it makes contact right there with the corner, and I cannot move it past that point. However, the turret can still rotate the remainder of the way until I reach this point that I have here, until the corner makes contact with the other box. It's just one of those quirks to watch out for on this kit, but other than that, the turret is really problem-free. And in case anyone's wondering, the other example that I built has the exact same type of quirk. So I guess if you're in a high-end helicopter, if you want to knock one of these things out, just spin the turret to this location over here and you'll be able to get this thing in a blind spot. Moving to the paint and the markings, this was one aspect of the build that I wanted to use to separate the two builds from one another outside of the Stinger missile locations that I mentioned before. With this example here, I went with a single tone of NATO green. And from the limited resources I was able to find of this vehicle, this appears to be the configuration that these vehicles generally were seen in. This is also the same type of color scheme which would be seen on vehicles like the Striker. And it's many derivatives. For the other build, however, I went with a different format. And rather than going with the single tone of NATO green, I went with a full three-tone NATO camouflage pattern. Of course, this camouflage pattern was widely used and was widely seen on many vehicles of the 1990s through the early 2000s time frame for both the U.S. Army as well as the U.S. Marine Corps. It wouldn't, of course, be up until the Iraq War period was when the U.S. military would switch from the woodland-type camouflage pattern to the all-yellow sand mustard color that we generally see on vehicles from that period. Moving to the markings, the vehicle supplies you with a set of water slide decals and they are intended to build the model in one configuration which was the test vehicle that took place during the 1993 evaluation. The quality of the markings are average at best, they don't disintegrate when they hit the water and they remove off of the paper backing pretty well. They also lacquer on pretty reliably as well because they don't crinkle up or dissolve when the lacquer is applied to the surface. However, even lacquered on, the decals can still have some silvering on them, specifically with this lighting situation that I have here. It's really not helping with 
some of the angles you'll see on the models when they rotate. Basically, what you see here was the best I was able to get with the lacquer I was using. And I also want to point out that since these builds here, I actually switched out my lacquer to a new type of varnish. And so far, I've been having some really good results with that. And you'll be noticing that on builds that I have in the pipeline that I'm going to be making videos for in the next coming week. So definitely stay tuned for that. However, for these two builds here, like I stated during the daytime and in, in natural sunlight, the decals look, or I should say the markings themselves look much better compared to some of the camera angles that I have here on this table. Well, at the end of the day, I'm really happy in how these two turned out. It's always a really good feeling to take an old kit that's been sitting in your stash for far too long, getting it brought out and building and making it reach the finish line. If you've ever accomplished one of these type of builds, you need a nice little pat on the back because it feels oh so good the moment you put the final brush stroke on and it goes directly into your collection. And this now slides us into skill level and recommendation. This kit here I do not recommend for a beginner and that's not just true for the AD version of the LAV25 but for all of the Italeri LAV25 based kits as well across the board. This is due to the fact that this kit does have quite a few of these really small, finely molded detail parts that are found on components like the suspension, the grab handles, the lift hooks, the lights, the other amenities on the hull. And with this one here, that's compounded with the added complexity of the turret. With the way the Stinger missile boxes get assembled, as well as with the Gatling gun that I mentioned before, all of these features that are found on this kit here really lend itself to be best tackled by someone who's an intermediate to an advanced range builder. Now, on the flip side of that, if you are the type of person that already have those skill sets, then these Italeri LAV25s are a really good kit family to jump into. There are a lot of different versions out there, and they build, in my opinion, really, really, really well. To add upon that, these kits here have been in production for a number of years, so there is a pretty good supply of them that are floating around. Because of this, they can be found relatively easily, and when they are found, can be had for some pretty affordable prices. Although the kit's tooling is pushing close to the 30-year-old mark at this point, the kits themselves have aged remarkably very well. The molding and detailing found on the surfaces as well as on the suspension go together in a very efficient way, and the overall look, fit, and finish on all these parts again, lend itself for a nice representable piece if you're looking for an LAV25. These kits here are just as relevant as they are today as they were back in the late 80s and early 90s when they first came out. Another advantage that these kits have, and this is really more or less leaning towards someone who's an advanced builder, is that because these kits have been on the market for as long as they have been, there are an extensive amount of aftermarket detail components that can be acquired to further enhance these kits. Components that are made in photo etch, cast resin, and I wouldn't be surprised even in 3D print can all be acquired in order to take the kit past what the out of the box rendition gives you. For recommendations, obviously the easiest one is if you're a fan of the LAV25 family. If you already have a few renditions of that vehicle in your collection, the addition of the AD is a complete no brainer. One other benefit that this particular kit has is that with the same kit, you can build the model in two different configurations like I've done over here. So if you're looking to have this version of the AD in your collection, I'd recommend picking up two of these kits so you could render it in the different formats just so you could really thoroughly flesh out your collection. I also recommend this kit for anyone who's a fan of post-Cold War armor. If you're the type of individual that likes military vehicles from the early 1990s all the way up till present day, this kit here would be a really easy addition in your collection. And I guess that's basically it. So with that, that wraps up this double feature model showcase video for these two 135th scale LAV25 AD air defense vehicles. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like these two fellas over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of these two builds as well as the other smaller and larger scale models that are frequently showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds as well as detailed components. Thanks a lot guys, I'll be seeing you again on the next one. Take care.